I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Roger Becker. Roger, he was an active real estate investor with mixed results before becoming fully passive three years ago um, and has since invested in, in many different asset classes. So um, first, Roger, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today, taking the time out um, and to come share your story. You got it, Jason. Uh, I look forward to our conversation and hopefully I can be of some value to you and uh, your listeners. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Um, why don't you start by just kind of telling us your story, giving, giving us some of your background and, and uh, you know, then we'll dive into the real estate side of things. Sure. Um, do you want me to to to, to background like pre, pre real estate career stuff? Or? Yeah, sure. Whatever. I mean, whatever you're comfortable with. But I think I find that with a lot of guests, they don't necessarily come from a real estate background. Um, and so it's just interesting to kind of see how all of that intertwines. Okay, sure. Um, so my background is in marketing and advertising. It's what I've really done at this point, embarrassingly enough, for 40 years. That's how old I am. So uh, right out of college and, um, you know, ha had some, um, you know, some some good success there after working, you know, a long time and uh, started my own business uh, in my late twenties ad agency. And, um, I, uh, one of my best friends, uh, that I met when I was in my, around that time, late twenties was a real estate guy, uh, in San Francisco where I lived. And he had been a, a broker for Marcus and Millichap of apartment buildings. And then he got onto the, um, the principal side and, and bought some apartment buildings. And I remember, you know, he and I used to run and in Golden Gate Park, and uh, I would say much faster than I could run now. Uh, but, uh, you know, I remember him telling me in 1998, I remember the day he told me I'm making 20 grand a month before I get out of bed in the morning. And I thought to myself, that sounds like paradise to me. And uh, that's I when wish someone, someone told me that in 1998, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would have been, that would have been amazing. Sorry, guys. sorry to interrupt, but I, well, that was just very, made, made me very nostalgic to have that information put in my face then. <laughs> let's put it this way, Jason, that made it uh, unnecessary to read rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I needed to know. Well, that got my ear because I was starting to do very well at that time, probably, you know, in my own business, but I was working my ass off, right? Every second to generate the money. So the passive income thing was like, yeah, I, I, I understand that, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, in the ensuing many years, uh, I um, did a lot of real estate on my own. And it's funny, it says with mixed results, uh, they really weren't mixed results. It was all bad. And um, and I failed at many different things uh, from buying houses, tons of houses, uh, new homes back in like 03, 04. Actually, it was mixed. You know, I, I forgot that uh, I have a very strong negative bias. I forgot that um, many of the homes we bought in 03, like, went up like 80% within six to 12 months. It was the weirdest thing in the world. I mean, we, we bought four homes in Bakersfield in the range of like 175 to 200. And they went up to like three and a quarter to 350 in like six to 12 months, which sounds fantastical and, and maybe hyperbolic, but it really did happen. And then we had the presence of mind to sell them. So it wasn't all terrible. But we also bought a bunch of Section 8 homes in Buffalo, New York. We paid all cash. It's a long story, but we ended up 
getting out with our tail between our legs lost probably about four hundred thousand dollars and and there are other things I did on my own uh, that I also lost a ton of money, bought an office building, small, like 5,000 square feet, actually mixed in Oakland, lost every penny of that. So um, now I'm being like one of my podcast guests where I'm talking on and on and on. Um, but, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, Jason, because uh, there are many people that have been in the real estate business for three years, five years, eight years, a dozen years that think, ah, well, real estate's really resilient. You don't lose money, which sounds wonderful. It, it, it It's untrue, but it does sound good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, as I mentioned before we started recording, I you know, sort of saw your, your bio had that, that sentence just struck me because it's, you know, as you just alluded to, we have had like a sort of unreal positive market in in all aspects for for many years whether that's stocks or real estate or whatever and now we're starting to hit a hard time again i'm not starting we're we're we've hit it um <clears throat> and i think a lot of people that are uh you know realizing that hey this is harder than <laughs> than it seemed for a little while and i think you know you pointed to a couple of different examples of of where you had where you had some trouble and but also i think important for people to understand like at the same time you also had those successes and and yeah we remember we remember the the bad ones remember the things the 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 failures i guess if you will hurt more than the successes feel good uh ultimately it, and i think that's probably probably true for most people i i uh maybe some eternal optimists that that really celebrate every win but we could we could do better to to probably celebrate our wins a little bit more. Um, but yeah, you, you, so you were investing at a time and and I I I know that uh the values went up like that in the, the 2003, 2004, because I bought a house around that time and it it doubled in value in like a year. It was amazing. And if you got out in time, fantastic, you did wonderful. But if you still had those assets in 2008, 2009 a lot of those values went back down. So um, what what do you think, you know, sort of what were your take home maybe lessons? What do you feel like you learned from that side, your active side of real estate investing, both good and bad, I guess would be, would be really nice to share with people. Yeah, no, good, good question. Um, my personal takeaway and, and everybody's situation is different, like how old you are and how much money you have to invest and what have you. But for me, uh, I, I concluded that I don't have the knowledge and it's possible that I don't even have the more than the knowledge. I might not even have the innate uh, intrinsic skill set to invest in real estate on my own. Uh, now, I'm also at an age where I don't have the, um, you know, I don't have the time horizon to make a lot of mistakes, uh, and nor do I have the appetite to spend the amount of time I believe it takes to master any skill. Um, so I've just concluded I need to, I need to find really, really, really a you know, successful, effective operators and invest with them. At the end of the day, I'll make more money and reduce risk. Um, but there's a whole process with that that I've learned over the last few years that I'm happy to dwell on, but I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so you're, you're I think maybe one thing that you probably left out is reduce, you know, sort of work and, and headache, I guess, the the stress factor of, um, being active, you know, once you find some trusted operators and it's not that, I guess, not that everything will, will go a hundred percent as planned always, but you, you don't have to, you're not putting in the day to day. You can, you know, sort of focus your energies elsewhere. When you kind of made that transition, what, how, how did you start that process of saying, okay, I, I guess I, I want to invest passively with others for someone who's maybe having that those same thought processes how did you 
go out and sort of find the people that you wanted to invest with? How did you select um, operators that you felt comfortable placing your capital with? Yeah, another good question. Um, well, let me, I think going, I started this process. I, I had I had, had a couple uh, capital events. I'd sold a couple uh, small, you know, multifamily uh, buildings in San Francisco, but you know, to 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 you know, to give you an idea, when I say small, one was a duplex that I lived in for thirty years. So you know, that was worth probably like a fifty-unit building in Kansas City, uh, and then the other one was a five-unit I bought in in San Francisco, um, and so I I sold both of those, and so it so then I had capital. So that was a few years ago. Uh, I think I first started, uh, I, I went on bigger pockets and identified a couple people, uh, sponsors through that. Uh, and then I started my own podcast three years ago and that's really, uh, and it got me into the podcasting world, uh, doing in meeting sponsors through my own interviews, like you're doing now, that was principally what it was. That was a few years ago through my podcast and then listening to other people's podcasts, but mostly my own. Yeah. And then did you set up, I guess, if you're, you're getting to interview them on your own podcast, maybe, maybe setting up, you know, separate times to get to know them better and things like that. Is there, how is that process? Cause I think you know, importantly, and in, in this we've mentioned this on this podcast, I think probably a lot of people in the real estate world now sort of understand the difference between um, accredited and non-accredited investors, but the deals that you're looking for, right? If you're if you're accredited, in theory, you can invest in anything. If you're non-accredited, now you've got to have these pre-existing relationships to get into the 506B deals. So when you were kind of going through all that, did you have, I guess, a specific path in mind, like specific asset classes, specific markets, or was that something you kind of figured out along the way through, through your podcast? And as you mentioned, you know, other listening to others. Yeah, yeah yes and no. Uh, I tend to be uh, not as systematic as that. Um, you know, I'm kind of a little bit more of a, from the hip kind of guy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which I don't advise. It's, I'm sure it's not even right for myself, but much less anybody else, but it's just kind of the way I roll. Uh, but, but what I would say is I have made, uh, a number of investments in the last few years, three ish years, uh, probably with a dozen or so sponsors and maybe 15 different deals. Um, and I, what I can do, Jason, is at least tell you where I am now is through that experience. Um, you know, I've learned an awful lot, again, the hard way. And what I'm looking for now is people that are, have done one asset class, ideally, forever. I mean, if they've done it for 20 years, that would be preferable to me. Um, and ideally in one market, uh, that's kind of hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I'm, I'm still somewhat uh, agnostic on asset class. Like, so for example, multifamily is having a real reckoning at this point um, in, in all, by all appearances will continue to. But, you know, somewhere out there, there's an amazing multifamily deal with, you know, so much meat on the bone that even with interest rates having escalated, et cetera, et cetera, there's a, a good investment for somebody. Yeah. Um, but more than anything else, I mean, I'm just learning the hard way uh, and as, as, as simplistic as this is, I think it really comes down to finding the right sponsor because I'm not necessarily capable of, of going through a pro forma and in really going, well, this makes no sense. And that does make sense. And, and what have you, I mean, I can, if from a 50,000 percent, a thousand feet perspective, but the other thing is, look, there are people that, 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 you know, um, 
that, that put together pro formas for a living and the sponsor you're dealing with, they might not have even put together the pro forma themselves. So, I mean, in the pro formas, like Kevin O'Leary says in Shark Tank, he's never seen a pro forma he didn't love. So it, you got to, it, it's, I'm looking for people that specialize. I'm sorry. It's a very long winded answer. Specialization is everything. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. And I think the point about, you know, people that have done it for, you know, 20 years or, or longer, I mean, it's having been through a previous downturn in the market cycle and, you know, sort of coming out the other side and still being successful. I think a lot of that um, plays into, you know, the track record. People always talk about the track record of the sponsor and there's, you know, you can't, you can't go back in time. So you started when you started, but there's, there's definitely something to be said for, um, you know, people that have that been through those, those more challenging markets. And as we're going through one now, um, and so you've, you've, it looks like kind of been in, in multiple different asset classes. So you're diversifying within your passive investments, but you want to invest with someone who's actually very specialized and niche down in their specific asset class as an, as an operator. Correct. I, sh I, I definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I mean, that makes a ton of I'm sense. Sorry. No, that's fine. In, in, in my own, in, in, in my own business, uh, I was a, I didn't have a focus until I found a niche 13 years in. And when I found that niche, everything turned and that's how long it took because you know, I was stupid. It took me a long time. So, so, and once I found that niche and then once I identified the niche, I would tell you, you know, it took another 10 years or so to be just an incredible expert in that. Now, a year in, I thought I was an expert because I had a big ego and I was cocky, but I mean, in looking back, um, honestly in 10 years and in, in, that's a rant, that's an arbitrary number, but I'm looking for somebody that's done it for years. Yeah. 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 Makes total sense. Um, do you have a favorite asset class? It sounds like you've been, been in multiple. Do you have, or do you have reasons maybe why you like, you know, several different asset classes for, for different reasons possibly? Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, and this is maybe confirmation bias, because this is where I put some money in, in the last few months. I kind of like neighborhood retail, um, because I think that if it's well located, once again, you have a good operator, um, it's, it's underbuilt, there's been very little new supply. And uh, there's, there's a strong demand for it. And, and a lot of that you know, a lot of those tenants are not going to be replaced online. I mean, you know, hair salons, restaurants, dog groomers, you know, uh, smoke shops, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, I, and I like it just because there's strong in, in place cash flow. And then, you know, there could also be really strong upside under market rents, deferred maintenance, all the stuff that applies to many asset classes. Yeah, that's fascinating. I it's not not something we talk about a lot. Um and I think I, I actually kind of agree with you. I think that the it's a it's a it's probably a lot less competition there, right? You you don't hear about, you know, probably not the institutional buyers. They're not going for, you know, your your neighborhood, you know, four stores, you know, kind of next to a 7-Eleven or something like that. That's not that's not what they're going after. So you're going to have a lot less competition there. Um and it's with the, I don't know, I don't want to say the death of office or whatever. It, it does seem though, like the large retail centers like malls and, and things like that are, are maybe less uh, performing less well. And now you have people almost digging in on those smaller neighborhood assets. And, and, and in some of the cities um, that sort of, making that a part of the community. So people will build, uh, even in new development, they're building like a, a mixed use apartment complex that has some retail associated with it. And it'll be those kind of smaller um, type shops like you just mentioned with the the hair salons and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think I think it's actually very fascinating and, and makes a lot of sense given that, you know, sort of the time that we're in, people don't want to go, uh, don't want to go as far, don't want to, you know, 
be in huge crowds of people. If they can get these things close to home, uh, it probably makes a lot of sense for those those you know types of shops and shopping centers to stay to stay active. You know, I was down your way, uh, Jason, over Christmas, and I couldn't help. And because I've invested in some of those recently, I couldn't help just to pay attention. And there's so many of them. Uh, and I was in the valley, uh, but you know, they're, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're, most of them are fully rented. I mean, not all of them, and there's always going to be a vacancy here and there, but then, you know, you look at the type tenants and they're not go. you're not going to replace a restaurant, you know, with Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're everywhere in LA. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure if it's quite so prevalent in other cities. I don't really know, but I mean it, yeah, those little, just even in my neighborhood, you know, I get, there's little, uh, you know, three or four shops just linked together there, um, kind of all over the place. So I, I, like I said, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense. It seems like, a, um, you know, I've never done any of the underwriting on them, so I don't know the, you know, what those metrics look like, but if you're saying, uh, strong in place cash flow, that, that makes a whole lot of sense to kind of get in, uh, into some stuff like that. It's, it really, it really is a, a you know, sort of an appealing place to, to put some money at, at this time. Um, well, Roger, let me let me switch gears here. I want to get to the part of the show where I get to ask you the questions that I ask every guest. And so the first one is based on the name of the show being Know Your Why. And so I always ask, you know, what is your why? What what drives you towards success? Kind of keeps you keeps you motivated. Yeah, um, I'm very unmotivated. <laughs> <laughs> Seem fairly successful for an unmotivated person. <laughs> But, you know, I'm in my 60s, for God's sake. So, uh, you know, so, you know, my why is is really passive income, you know, and I'm in I'm in consummate capital preservation mode. Uh, like you, I have two kids. My kids are older than 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 uh, than your kids, but I want to leave something for them. So capital preservation is is number one. I just it's the Warren Buffett thing. It will number one don't lose money rule number two don't forget rule number one yeah makes total sense and i think the our our whys evolve over time and and you know kind of depending on our life stage and where we are if we're heading i i i too hope that uh when i get to my 60s it'll be everything will be passive i'll do work where i want to work but there'll be enough uh in terms of passive income to to not have to worry about it for myself and my my family. Um, second question is, tell us something about yourself that that maybe isn't common knowledge, a special skill, a hobby, um, something that that sort of lets the listeners know you a little better. Well, boy, I asked that question too, and I've never thought how I would answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing a lot of people don't know about me, which is I probably weird to share, but I am a recovering, uh, alcoholic, uh, and drug addict for 35 years. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. So, uh, I, I have the, well, I know a lot of people, uh, also recovering. So, um, it's, uh, a space I'm familiar with, but I, um, that's very, very commendable that you're recovering. That's, uh, that's uh, at that point, that's, that's what you can ask for. So good for you. Yeah. I hope that was for sure. The wrong answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Again, it's, it's, there's no wrong answer. It's, it's about what you're comfortable with. So, uh, no, that that's, uh, it's inspiring. I think people, um, when people hear things like that, you know, uh, it, it helps them maybe, maybe realize that they too can, can sort of, turn things around. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy well, I, for you. I, 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 you know what, let's put it this way. There's hope for all you see students out there. Let's just put it yeah. that way. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that, that could be the, the, uh, title of this podcast episode. <laughs> There's hope for the C student. Um, <laughs> when people hear this, Roger, and they want to reach out to you, what's the best way to keep, get in touch? Uh, you can, uh, email me is probably a good way. Old school rbecker at beckermedia.net. Perfect. We'll put that in the show, new, show notes. Um, final question for you. What, what advice would you give to someone who's just getting started uh, in real estate? They're, they're trying to find their footing and, and um, kind of unsure what the next steps would be. What, what would you tell them? Yeah. 
It's a hard one because I've not done it, Jason. So, um, but you know, I mean, you can use passive investing. That's, that's yeah, okay. you have well, done it. niche, niche, yeah. right? And um, you know, because the the tighter the niche is, the the more competitive you're going to be uh, in the marketplace and more value that you will provide to, you know, people that invest with you or people that you're brokering to whatever avenue that you choose, uh, riches and niches. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. Um, well, Roger, this has been, this has been great. Thank you for coming and, and sharing your story. Uh, appreciate what you've, what you've, uh, the value you've added to the listeners. So thank you so much for your time. Got it. I appreciate it, Jason. Awesome. folks listening uh i'm sure you're gonna love this episode please like rate and review so we can get more great guests like roger and everyone have a great day i'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey without a strong why it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential my name is dr jason Ballara, and every week i meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms we will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.